Hi. I can't hear you. Whoops. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. From underneath the blanket fort in my cupboard, I'm Mia Friedman and you're listening to the last in our special lockdown series where we call people up and ask how they're doing. And what a way to wrap up the series, because ever since we've been in COVID-19 lockdown, Dr. Norman Swan has become one of our most famous Australians. He's been the calm, sweetly accented voice in our ears with his CoronaCast podcast and the reassuring figure on our TV screens. He's been the one keeping us up to date with all the latest science, and he's somehow, in this very anxious time, helped us feel a bit safer. You know, like the adults are in charge. Before that, you'd find Norman on his weekly radio show on ABC Radio National, The Health Report, where he's been an investigative journalist for decades. He's actually trained in paediatrics, but has taken very much a crash course in COVID-19 over the past few months. So what's it like to be a rock star of a global pandemic? They're my words, not his. He's actually very humble. He'd never call himself a rock star. But how is he processing this weird and sudden fame? And most importantly, Norman... Is everything going to be okay? Here is Norman Swan. Norman Swan, how much sleep are you getting? (laughs) Well, I've never been a good sleeper and I'm getting even less now. I probably probably only get about um, four or five hours good good sleep. Was it like this before Corona? It's worse now, but um, yeah, I've never been a good sleeper. Uh, Is that a little hint of a sniffle that I can hear and should Australia be worried? No, Australia should not be worried. It's my perennial rhinitis and I've been tested and I'm negative. Good. Because I remember one of my low moments was, uh, and I think I speak for many, when we heard that you had been tested and we all held our breath because it was at that time, and I'm kind of joking around, but it was at that time in the first couple of weeks where no one knew how bad it was going to get and we didn't know if Australia was going to be Italy or America. Yeah. What were those first couple of weeks like for you? A really weird. I can. I actually started a diary during that. I've never been a diarist, but I started collecting a diary. And, and you know, because I'm not going to that habit, every two or three days I remember. Oops, I haven't done it, and then I catch up. It's very hard to remember actually those early days because things have moved so fast. I mean, it's 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 May. The first case was in November, um, and essentially it was like walking into a vacuum without realizing that you'd done it. And the, uh, when we started doing the Chronocast, which was not my idea, it was actually the idea of uh, Tanya Nolan and News and Current Affairs here in the ABC, I thought, well, that'd be a nice thing to do. You know, she, but she actually had her finger on the pulse, that people were really wanting answers and they weren't getting them from anywhere else. And what was really weird, so I, yeah, I'm used to um, some degree of recognition, but not a lot. You know, when I, I did Biggest Loser for a while, and I'd bump into eight-year-olds in the street who recognised me. But by and large, wait, were you on that? You weren't on the Biggest Loser as a contestant. What, what, no, no, what? I, I was. I was the medical host of Biggest Loser for I, six years. I not, missed that. Not a well-known fact. For most of your audience. Um, I think. I think the peak age group for the audience was the, the eight to ten-year-olds who absolutely loved it. Yeah, kids love that show. Yeah, and um, so. I, but you know, when you're used to doing radio, you knuckle down, you're used to not being recognised, and you just get on with it. And that's what we did with Tegan and I and, we, and with our producer, Will Ockenden. We just got on with it. And then suddenly I started to notice funny things happening, like a friend of mine saying to me, um, I can't go to hydrotherapy anymore for my rehabilitation. I said, well, that's interesting. Why are you telling me this? And she said, because it's your fault. Because the physiotherapist had said that nobody was coming anymore. And why? Because Dr. Swan had told me that swimming. I said, I never said that. <laughs> and, then, and then at one point I said I was still going to the gym, but you know, this is very early on, but you know, wiping my hands and rubbing everything with uh, hand sanitizer. And the gym that I go to knew that I went there and they were advertising, you know, Norman Swan said it's okay to go to gyms. And of course, three days later, I've said I'm stopping going to gyms. You suddenly realize that Mm. that there's this audience out there and you've got to actually be really careful with what you say. And I mean, most recently, I I mean, I kind of did it it deliberately. We got this question about farting and whether farting could spread the virus, which was a tongue-in-cheek question. And I answered equally tongue-in-cheek. It went global. 
Wait, can it? <laughs> that's right, that's right. No, I'm being serious. Well, I, can it? Yeah, no how far a fart can go. Yeah. And Rush Limbaugh quoted it in uh, the United States, but he thought it was serious. And then Steve Colbert did a piece on it. He knew it was a he knew it was a bit of fun, and uh, you know the fart that went around the world, and just from this little podcast in Sydney. So, so the answer to your it was a long answer to a short question, which you still is haven't that, answered the fart question. The fart question. Um, I think it depends on the farter, right? And you know the expulsive re- regime. But I, I think it would be a stretch to say you could get to New York from Sydney. Okay. Um, but in answer to the first two questions, the first two, first two weeks were weird. We just got down to it and did it and then suddenly realized we had, it wasn't just the COVID-19 that had an exponential curve going up. It was the audience desperate for questions. And I would do things like go running upstairs, you know, out for my morning run, running upstairs and some young, it's a, it's a young audience. And this young woman coming towards me saying, oh, I'm listening to your Corona cast as I'm out for my walk. And it just has this wide demographic. Yeah, it was the millennials at Mamma Mia um, who got me onto it and and, start, and I'm like, oh, Norman's got a podcast. What was your role at the ABC before Corona? So I've been at the ABC for a long time and I joined initially as a science producer and um, in science and medicine. So I, I had a midlife crisis in my 20s and decided I didn't want to get to my 50s and look back in my life. There was something else I wanted to do. I was originally going to be an actor. An actor? Well, try telling a Jewish mother that her son, the doctor, is not going to be her son, the doctor, but her son, the actor. It doesn't, it doesn't actually work. <laughs> not that thrilled. No. And uh, so I, I compromised and did medicine because it was much easier to become a second-rate doctor than a second-rate actor. But I always had that in my bones that I wanted to do. I did a lot of acting and directing at university. And then after I graduated, it all came back that I wish. I didn't want, regret this is one of the worst things I can imagine in life. And I didn't want to get into my 50s, say, look back in my life and wish there was something else I'd done. So I actually did an audition for RADA. And oh, Carrier, which is like the uh, English equivalent of NIDA. That's right. And failed miserably. You know, just failed miserably. And that's when I came out to Australia for a year and then stayed. But it came back with this desire to do something else. I've got acting out of my symptom system. But, in, uh, but I, I, I knew there was something else I wanted to do. I went part time at the children's hospital in Sydney, and then I went, and then I, I was going to go back to full time. I was doing all sorts of other things, writing, just trying out other stuff. It was like, like my gap year in my twenties, and I opened the Sydney Morning Herald, and there was this ad for a producer to make science and medical programs on ABC Radio. And if somebody had actually asked me, that would have been my dream job, and I got it, and that's where I've stayed. So. I've, I joined. I didn't do a health show for four or five years. I did technology. I did social sciences. I did a series on Israel uh, uh, called Visions of Israel, which was quite a controversial documentary series on the Zionist idea. I did. I actually started the first breakfast program on Radio National. So I did a lot of things in those first five years before I started the health report in 1985. And then I. And then five years later, I became the general manager of Radio National. Radio National was dying and um, David Hill brought me in because I had quite strong views about which way it should go. And um, I came in and that's when we created Radio National Breakfast that's still on air with France, where we created Life Matters, brought in Philip Adams to do Late Night Live, Geraldine Dugan and so on. So a lot of the structure of Radio National today is what we put in all those years ago. Can I ask a dumb question? Are you a medical doctor or a scientist? And is there a difference? Uh, there's a huge difference. I think scientists are real doctors and doctors of medicine are pretend doctors because they, they just pr- decided at one point in the 19th century they'd put doctor in front of your name, whereas scientists earn their doctorate by doing a PhD. So I'm a medical doctor. I did medicine at uh, the University of Aberdeen in Scotland and I did my postgraduate qualifications in paediatrics in Britain and then came out here. So I've got a couple of degrees in paediatrics for postgraduate qualifications um, and I was specialising in paediatrics, training in paediatrics in Australia. I never got my Australian fellowship because I joined the media before I did that. So I can't call myself a paediatrician, but I trained in paediatrics. So you haven't seen patients for a long time? No. I've seen, I've seen patients informally in the ABC. One day yeah, I will write, sure. I write up my experience uh, <laughs> uh, of seeing patients in the ABC, including a very famous broadcaster in the old days when we were up in King's Cross where we had offices that didn't were not glassed in who walked into my um, 
office and dropped his pants <laughs> and said, could you have a look at this? <laughs> and told me some horrible story about what he'd been up to in Bangkok. Oh, my God. And, uh, and I said, you know, would you mind if I don't touch this? And he said, well, could you just do it? I said, well, you've got a general practitioner. Go to your general. No, I don't know. I can't go to my GP. With this It's too embarrassing. Could you just deal with it? And so I said, oh, really? Okay. So I sent him off for tests. And being obsessive compulsive, I wrote this detailed uh, referral note saying this person has done a <laughs> indescribable <laughs> things in Bangkok. <laughs> and I said, and it was like, it was in the 80s. And I said, have you heard of this thing called AIDS? And he said, oh, well, vaguely. I said, I'm going to have to do one of these tests on you. And it's a new test. Um, and so anyway, two weeks went by. And I, 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 he phoned me up and he said, have you got the test results? I said, oh, no, that's why you should have your own GP. Because I'm yeah. not a GP and I don't chase out the test. Sorry, sorry, sorry. He said, it's okay. I've got them. I said, oh, how did you get them? He said, the human resource department of the ABC got it and opened it. And then oh. Oh. <laughs> That'll teach him. Yeah, for, fortunately, uh, he was not. He was all clean. Um, one of the most Googled things when you Google your name is, are you married? Tell um, us a bit about the man behind the doctor. Am I married? Technically, at the moment, I'm still married, yes, but I'm separated, about to be divorced from my second wife. And have you got kids? I've got three adult kids. Um, Jonathan, who's a White House reporter in Washington, who reports on the White House and the Trump administration. He's doing, quite, he's doing very well. My middle daughter, who's called Anna, who is married, lives in Sydney, and uh, she was in marketing and finance, and now she's doing a, a training in early childhood. And my youngest daughter, Georgia, who lives in Singapore and works in the healthcare industry. And have you got any grandkids? No grandkids. Not yet. Not yet. So are you looking for love? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Do you have time? Um, Is there an email address that people can apply? <laughs> so I, I've, um, I think I've found it for the time being. So you're dating at the moment? Yes. It's funny. I mean, I'm, I'm joking with you because um, I know you quite well. But um, it, there's been a, a, a bit of a phenomenon where – women have described having romantic feelings towards um, people during this crisis, people who make them feel safe and who provide them with either information or money. So Josh Frydenberg, uh, Gladys Berejiklian, Daniel Andrews, um, yourself, you are often uh, numbered among them. Is that a weird thing to sort of be like a bit of a rock star in a global in the time of a global pandemic. Now I know you're a very humble sort of modest person, but you must have noticed. Um, uh, look, I, 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 it weirds me out actually, to be honest. I and I don't particularly welcome it. it, it look, it's it's very flattering, is, is what I, is what I would say, and. The, um, and I try not to think about it too much because I think it can go, you, it can distort your view of reality. Mm. Um, not that it's, you know, not that it's, it's in a very small space and probably very temporary as well. That's it. That's the other thing. It's, it's transient. Yeah, it, that's interesting. It's, it's an interesting reflection. I mean, I, I've been in the media a long time and it, and, it, and it waxes and wanes. Sometimes you get notoriety when I exposed Dr. McBride and his fraud all those years ago. Um, I was in the media of solid commercial and ABC for weeks because of the controversies around that. And you get this recognition and it comes and goes. And you just got to stay a bit centered because it is transient. And the other thing, I mean, I don't know whether you've noticed this, but um, you've got to be careful about friendships. And which friendships actually are friendships and which friendships are there because you have a degree of notoriety. notoriety celebrity or what have you and um and, and and it's only by being grounded that you can recognize friendships for what they are the the combination of um sort of calm persona and tone and medical background has made you one of the uniquely placed people to provide information, but you don't work for the government and you're, you're, you're a journalist essentially. Is that how you would describe yourself, a journalist? Absolutely, journalist and broadcaster. So how, how have you 
handled that during this time? Because as you say, when you say I can, I'm going to the gym or I'm not going to the gym, this is not public policy. You are not um, the chief medical officer. You are not the prime minister or the, the health minister. How have you managed that? And has there been any sort of government pushback? How I've managed that is by staying focused on what I do and what I do as so all journalists are storytellers and storytellers of truth, one hopes. So that's that's the basic. What you do is you tell a story. You tell stories in your regime and you're in your not regime, but in, in your world. And I tell stories in my world and it's based on facts and, if, and only when it's based on fact or will people learn to trust you and. Uh, trust is a really important thing. So my task is in medical and health journalism. I mean, I do do regular journalism when I stand in on Radio National Breakfast, for example. But in, in health and medical journalism, is stick to the facts, stick to what's published. And my role is to translate complex information into words that people can uh, can understand. And that's not about people's intelligence. It's just simply about people's training. My middle daughter Anna, just as an example, had a very bad brain injury in a uh, very terrible accident in Italy and she was in intensive care. And I, I had a friend in the hospital, in that particular Italian hospital who was our translator and he went away for a while. And I got in uh, another friend who's Italian, speaks English with an English accent, superb English, but he couldn't translate for me in the intensive care unit because it was another world of language. Mm-hmm. So, the, so being able to translate complex information into language that people understand is, I suppose, the skill that I've built up over all these years, and you just got to stick to that knitting. And are you talking about evidence, not your own opinion, not your own view of the world? Is it is it evidence? Can you back it up? And as long as you stick to that, then it's reliable. And really, I don't worry what the government's saying or what the chief medical officer is saying. What does the evidence say? And for the early days of this epidemic, the evidence said different things from what the government was saying. And, there, and that sort of set off a social media world and people saying, well, you know, who do we trust here? And that it was not, it was never a competition of trust, but, it, but the government was breaking some of the rules of communication. When you've got a pandemic, there's a, there are rules about what you do with communication and they, they kind of broke them. And there are rules about what you do in terms of what you shut down and what you don't. In and what way, in what way was, it, was it contradicting the rules of a pandemic? Rule number one is politicians don't do the communicating. You, you find a trusted, you know, your chief medical officer becomes the trusted person, like the Tony, well, Tony Fauci in America is not the chief, it's not the, but he's become that sort of person. Mm. Um, the chief medical officer in New Zealand strongly taken on that. And Brendan Murphy's kind of grown into that role. But I think it was, at the beginning, it was pretty faltering. And if a politician, and I think that they were obsessed in the beginning not to panic people. You know, mm. don't panic. Most people have a American, remember this? That's what they said in the first yeah. two or three weeks. Don't panic. It's a mild illness. It's not a problem. Most people will be fine with this. Well, that's what and, Trump said. Did did Scott Morrison said that? I mean, there was that weekend that he said he was going to go to the footy, but which yeah. was awkward, but he kind of righted himself that. after prior, that. Yeah, prior to that, they were, they were talking about this not being a problem. Now, um, if the chief medical officer says that, it's fine. But as soon as a politician says to you, don't oh, panic, yeah. everybody panics. Yeah regardless of what political party they belong to. So the, the, the information has got to be straight, it's got to be trusted, and it's got to be non-political. And at, at the beginning, um, this clearly was going to go rogue. You could predict the way the epidemic was going to go. You knew the sequence of things that had to happen, and they weren't happening. And in a week where, and there was just that extraordinary week where it all came to a head, where uh, and I just couldn't keep my mouth shut uh, on it because it was so against the evidence. You had the Grand Prix, quarter yeah. of a million people, many from people overseas. You had the football. You had a basketball match with 14,000 people in Western Australia. Mad stuff, completely mad stuff, and which broke all the rules. And then people, and, and then the other rule is that the reason that you've got to have trust and be, you've got to be consistent in your messaging. Otherwise, people say, why are you telling me to social distance? to be social distancing and wash my hands and you're going to go to the footy on a Saturday night or mm. I can go to the basketball and say it does not make sense. So when things were righted and all the, all the right systems were put in place, why do you think Australia has seemingly come through this so well? Um, 
because the community and business were ahead of government. There's two or three reasons. One is business was already saying to um, its staff work from home before anything happened. So they were two yeah. a couple of weeks ahead. The community was already getting the message about washing your hands and socially distancing. That was already beginning to happen because we t in Australia, we tend to be a community that cares about each other. And, and you never, uh, quoting a researcher at the Australian National University, Kamalini Lokugi, who's probably got the most experience in Australia as a researcher of on the ground epidemic control, such as Ebola, you know, she argues, Governments don't control pandemics, communities do. Unless the community buys in, then it's not going to happen. And the community bought into it. And then the state governments were ahead of the curve, were ahead of the federal government, because the state governments have got to carry the can. They're the ones who run stuff. Federal government doesn't run anything apart from the defense forces and a couple of other things. They set policy and collect taxes. I'm not criticizing anybody, it's just the way it works. State governments, the buck stops with them. And they got onto it. Victoria, New South, they all did actually, and got onto it incredibly well. And, and they shut down schools. Mm. Shutting down schools is actually a critical factor here. So the Commonwealth never wanted to shut down schools because they said, oh, children don't spread this virus. But the states did. The states did. Now, the reason you shut down schools, partly it's spread, and it's true, children don't spread it a lot. They spread it a little, but not a lot. Um, but you can't shut down, you can't go to lockdown or serious social distancing unless you close the schools because it forces parents to stay at school. It takes thousands of cars off the road and massive circulations, massive circulation of people associated mm. with school attendance. And and so you can't do anything until you close shut down schools. School. And equally, you, on the other side, this side we're on now, you can't do anything without opening them up. You've got to be really careful how you do that. Norman, how did you feel when you saw Donald Trump suggest that people inject bleach into their lungs? Um, I've ceased to be surprised by what Donald Trump says or does. I mean, it was just utterly shocking. Yeah. Um, and I felt for... The doctors who are, who are sure. having to stand up next to him in these absurd press conferences. Yeah. And, you know, he has, he has to take responsibility for many of the deaths in the United States. Andrew Cuomo has to take responsibility with de Blasio for New York State. Um, they waited three weeks. Every day you wait makes a difference. Now, we said that right at the beginning, and people mm. didn't quite believe it. And, but you, know, you see the, the truth of it. The, in November, there was only one person in the whole wide world with COVID-19. And now we've got over three million, as we speak today, over three million, quarter of a million deaths, which is an underestimate. It's extraordinary just how fast and mm. vicious this has been. Just finally, do you think we're out of the woods? No, we're definitely not out of the woods. We, we um, Internationally, we're not. It's now going to go into the developing world, going to spread there. Um, and the question is just how bad it will be. Um, in Australia, even in New York, let's take New York, for example. So they've had this terrible epidemic, one of the worst in the world, if not the worst in the world. Um, the evidence is that maybe 14 or 15 percent have been infected. So after all that agony they've gone through, and you hear people talk about herd immunity, they haven't got enough immunity in the community to prevent a second wave. You've got to have 60 or 70%, and that's theoretical. Um, so we've probably got, you know, 1%, 2%, who knows what we've got, but it's tiny. It doesn't really matter whether it's 1% or 4, 14%. We're vulnerable to a second wave, and, and it, could, it could be bad. I don't think it will be. I think that we will get outbreaks like the abattoir in Victoria, the odd school outbreak maybe, um, as, as we go through. And it's just a question of how we control that and how well we stand on these things and get them under control. We individually have got to be willing to be tested if we've got a cough and a cold, um, if we're contact traced, go into quarantine. And that's the price we'll pay for moving on. The big question is when can we open the borders? And generally open the borders a long, you know, long time before we're going to be able to do that. But we will be able to open up to New Zealand, Taiwan. We could do that now, actually, with Taiwan. They've got such little COVID-19. Hong Kong, probably. Singapore, if they get their act together, they've got a bad epidemic at the moment. But not but, if those countries haven't shut their borders properly. Yeah, that, that's right. They've got to be hermetically sealed and controlling it well. Hey, thank you for everything that you have done and continue to do. Uh, you looks certainly looks like you've been working around the clock and you've just provided such calm, fact-based uh, reassurance and information at a time when we've all needed it so much. So thanks, You're friend. Yeah. You're welcome.
Lots of love. See you soon. Bye. Bye. That was Dr. Norman Swan, and you can listen to his podcast, CoronaCast, on all the good places you get podcasts. And I've got a surprise for you this week on No Filter. It's going to be coming to you a day earlier. We usually drop the show on Monday, as you know, but we're dropping this one on Mother's Day this Sunday because we have a pretty extraordinary story from one of the Mamma Mia family, Jesse and Claire Stevens' mum, Anne Stevens. I'm not going to spoil it, but let me just say it is not one to miss. Until then, stay safe, take care, and even though we're allowed a little more freedom, please don't be licking any door handles. Those things are really germy. Bye, friends.